Welcome to our lecture series, and today we are going to discuss the chain of infections. I am Professor Tekea Palata, a specialist in uh, clinical microbiology. So let's look at the chain of infection. You know, for any infection to take place, we need to have all the elements of the chain of infection. So that's what we are going to describe. And the role of infection prevention is actually to put measures in place on how to break the chain, okay? So the chain of infection. The chain of infection involves six elements. The first one is that you need an infectious agent. If there is no infectious agent, you know, a bacteria or a virus or a parasite or any microorganism, and then the infection will not take place. So the first thing you need an agent, a microbial agent that will cause an infection. Then the second thing you need is a reservoir. So that microorganism will sit somewhere in a reservoir that we call the source of the infection of the microorganism. So it will sit in the reservoir. So you have a, a, a microbial agent inside a reservoir. But then you need a portal of exit, anything that will allow that microorganism to come out, to exit the reservoir, to exit the source, so that it can be in contact with someone, you know, to be able to cause an infection. So you need a portal of exit, but then you need a specific mode of transmission, you know, to allow that microbes that exited to be transmitted somewhere to the host. You know, you need a mode of transmission. Then you need a portal of entry to the host, you know, so you can have a microbes from a reservoir that existed, specific mode of transmission, but if there is no mode portal of entry to the host, the infection will not take place. So you need a portal of entry, either the host will inhale it, or it will be in contact with, or it's, you know, so you need any portal of entry to the host. Then the last element of the chain is a susceptible host. So that host, that person who will be susceptible to develop the infection. So all those six elements are very important so that we have a chain of infection. So this is what we call the chain of infection made of these six elements. So to try to prevent an infection, and that is the objective of infection prevention. Infection prevention, its objective is to put measures in place anywhere in the chain to try to break the chain. You know, what is it that you can do to break the chain at any of these points? But that will not be the reason for this present lecture, this lecture here, it's just to take you through the chain of infection so that you can understand what makes it possible for an infection to take place. So the first element we said it's a pathogenic agent. You need a microorganism, a bacteria, a virus, or a parasite, or a fungi, or anything. So those Pathogenic agents are medically important microorganisms. Those are microorganisms that are capable of causing infection. So they are the first element of the chain because if they are not, then there will not be an infection. So what are those medically important microorganisms? They, are, they can be divided in different kingdoms. You have the protists that are made of bacteria, fungi and protozoa. Then you have the Animalia kingdom that are made of helmets and arthropod. Then you have the adults that are mainly viruses and the prions, you know. So prions are infectious proteins. 
They are proteins that are infectious, that are able to cause an infection, but they are originally proteins. They are extremely different from other microorganisms. Okay, so they can cause conditions like uh, uh, Creutzfeldt Jakob's disease, they, uh, what we call the mad cow disease. They can cause Kuru, that is um, commonly found in uh, Papua New Guinea, for example, in Australia. You know, so those are diseases caused by prions. So those are medically important microorganisms. Any of these can be a, an infectious agent. Then the second element in the chain is a source or a reservoir, <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> the reservoir can be a human body, a human host, you know, like in the hospital setting, the reservoir can be the patient, the reservoir can be the healthcare workers, or the visitors can also be reservoir, you know, because they have the endogenous normal flora. Just look at our lecture normal flora to see the amount of bacteria, you know, that covers our human host, okay, our cells. So the reservoir can be a patient who is heavily colonized in the hospital, you know, so carries microorganism uh, or the healthcare workers themselves can also be the reservoir or the source of the microorganism. Or the reservoir can be inanimate environment sources. You know, our environment can be a reservoir. Like in the hospital setting, you have the sink, you have the mattresses, you have the equipment, the soiled material, linen, um, syringes, needles, all those represent reservoir or sources for, from which the microorganism can be transmitted. Okay, then the third element in the chain is what we call the portal of exit, you know. So those microorganisms, let's say um, you are in the hospital setting, you have patients who are coughing and sneezing, you know, so they have to exit. The microorganism have to exit through the sputum, through the droplets that are released, you know, so, so they have to exit, you know, and some even of the microorganism or the droplets that, are, that fall on the floor, they dry there. Now, let's say you come and you are doing a dry cleaning. The dry cleaning, the reason why it is not allowed in a hospital setting is because you can be able to aerosolize some of those material, infectious material that settled on the floor. You aerosolize them, then you make them to exit so that they can be exposed to people, to susceptible hosts. So this is the third element of the chain. You need a portal of exit. Then the fourth element in the chain, it's what we call mode of transmission. How is this microorganism to be transmitted? It can be transmitted via contact, what we call contact transmission. The contact can be direct or indirect, okay? Direct contact, it's usually via our hand, you know? So you can, uh, as I said, you can touch your nose, and greet someone. You transmit directly the microorganism. Or in the hospital setting, you will see someone uh, coming with his hands without washing them, going to handle a patient or to do the dressing of a wound. Or you see a medical doctor moving from one patient to another patient without washing his hand. So there is a direct transmission. But the transmission can also be indirect via specific things, okay? Like we see often a nurse dressing a wound, then uh, you have a phone ringing, then that person will rush, go with the soiled gloves, you know, respond to the phone and put the phone back, leave the microorganism there, then someone else will come and try to use the phone to make a call, carries those microorganisms, and the transmission continues. So you create a chain of infection, okay? Those are indirect transmission. Or you have a doctor with a stethoscope examining a patient, 
you know, then without cleaning the stethoscope, move that same stethoscope from oh, that patient to another patient, to another patient, to another patient, or a thermometer from one patient to another patient, another patient without cleaning it, okay? So it's doing, it's a, a, an indirect transmission via something, okay? So those are contact bond transmission. We have droplet transmission and we have airborne transmission. Now the difference between droplet transmission and airborne transmission is mainly the size of the particles. Okay, you know, droplet bone infection, the particles are too large. They are large enough so that they cannot travel long distances. Within a meter, those particles will be, uh, will fall on the floor. So it's like someone sneezing and coughing, the particles are released. There are particles that are large, particles that carry microorganisms that are released, but within one meter, those particles will fall because of their sizes, okay? But the airborne particles are tiny particles, usually less than five micrometer in diameter. And the droplets are often above 10 micro, micrometer in diameter. So the airborne are usually the particle smaller than five micrometer, and they have the possibility to remain suspended into the air and they can travel long distances. They can be moved by the wind, you know, and if you don't have a proper ventilation, what we call cross ventilation, then you cannot be able to get rid of those microorganisms, but we are not discussing the infection prevention and control measures here, so we will not discuss them. So contact, we say, it involves skin-to-skin -skin contact or direct physical, direct physical transfer of microorganisms from one patient to another or by healthcare workers, that's what we say. So when there is a direct transfer of microorganisms from one person into another, okay? So that's contact. So direct contact is like examination of patient followed by contaminated hands of healthcare workers and cross transmission to another patient. So you are dealing with one patient, you have swelled hands, you move there without washing your hand or using uh, hand sanitizers you go and start assessing another patient. That is direct transmission of microorganisms. And you can see here, the most important measure to put in place is hand hygiene, hand hygiene, hand hygiene, hand hygiene is the most important intervention to put in place in this case. Please always remember this, okay? Then we have indirect contact. Indirect contact is contact with inanimate objects or surfaces like bedpan, thermometers. I gave an example of stethoscope and so on that are contaminated with microbes and you transfer them to other patient. And some of the microorganisms that can be transmitted via contact usually we have uh, Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, ESBL producing gram negative bacteria, or even Clostridium difficile can be transmitted, especially if you poorly handle the feces of someone infected with Clostridium difficile, you can cause contact bone transmission. So the droplet, as I indicated, the droplet involves spread of pathogen by respiratory droplets produced during either coughing, sneezing, talking, or respiratory therapy procedures like intubating patient or doing any procedures that can, you know, aerosolize some of the respiratory um, pathogens or particles. So respiratory droplets are larger than five micrometer and they do not remain suspended into the air for a long period of time and fairly close with patient is required for transmission. So that's why the distance between patient or the distance between people is very important
to avoid droplet bomb transmission because that's why the, this is the reason why the hospital bed should be at least the distance between the two bed in the hospital should be at least one meter apart or 1.5 meter to avoid droplet bone transmission because those particles they go within one meter they fall so to avoid to be exposed you need a distance above from one meter and above to avoid you know so to avoid that or you need to use personal protective equipment you can use maybe a mask you know a simple surgical mask can protect you know against droplet bone infection and most of the microorganisms that are you know transmitted via droplet we have an Neisseria meningitis we have streptococcal pneumonia we have also influenza viruses they can be transmitted via droplets. But airborne, the particles I say are less than five micrometer in diameter and they are also produced by coughing, sneezing, or any other procedures, respiratory procedures, you know, that can release respiratory uh, particles. So because those, drop, those particles are too small, less than five micrometer in diameter, they desiccate to form droplet nuclei that remain suspended in the air for a long period of time and they can travel long distances. So droplet nuclei can infect the susceptible host several, um, several meters away from where they are producing, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, you know, varicella zoster virus, measles can be transmitted via airborne Okay, so the only way you can prevent this type of transmission is through a proper ventilation, cross ventilation, where the natural ventilation open windows from both sides of the room to allow a very good ventilation. Or if you are doing any procedure and you need the N95 respirators that can protect you, you know, so it's only N95 respirators that can be able to protect you against this type of airborne transmission. So beside those three major modes of transmission, especially in the hospital setting, there are also many other modes of transmission, like uh, through the contamination of water supply, contamination of equipment, solutions, needles, multi-dose vials, that can be contaminated any and any other articles that can also represent a major, a, a major mode of transmission. Then we need a portal of entry. Portal of entry, it's either through inhalation, so we inhale some of the particles, they go into our lung or we ingest them or we have a cut here then uh, you come in contact with something that goes through your body so all those are different portal of entry that allow us to come into contact with the microorganism then the last element in the chain of infection is the presence of a susceptible host so all the factors especially the host immune system you know the host underlying problems the all that make the, a specific host to become susceptible to a specific infection or the specific pathogen. So this is, you know, what we call the chain of infection. So you need all these elements together, you know, to be there so that an infection can take place. Okay, so in other lectures, I will then discuss with more details measures that you can then put in place to break the chain of infection at each of these points. Thank you for now and goodbye.